All right, everyone. Welcome back to the channel. My name is Drew. This is your first time here. Great to see you. In this channel, we are studying uh, human anatomy and particularly functional anatomy. So that means we're trying to understand how the body works in terms of mechanical movement. So when a muscle contracts and it pulls on a bone, what does the actual end result mean? So the movement per se. So if you're a a uh, personal trainer, a yoga teacher, if you're a manual therapist, a massage therapist, or a body worker, or just super interested in human anatomy, um, this channel will be quite helpful for you, hopefully. So we've been looking at the shoulder, and today we're going to look at the rotator cuff muscles, and we're going to do one at a time because they're all quite complex in their own real right. And we're going to start with this bad boy here, which is called infraspinatus. So without any further ado, let's get stuck into it. So this is one of the five rotator cuff muscles. So we have infraspinatus that sits here. Then you're going to have subscapularis which sits above here. You've got teres minor and teres major, which sit below here. Uh, there is some argument whether they're actually a rotator cuff muscle, but I consider them to be one. Then you have subscapularis, which actually sits between the shoulder blade and rib cage on the front. And those five make up the rotator cuff muscles. And they all basically attach around this area on the shoulder, on the humerus. So we're going to break them down into uh, individual muscles, and then we'll kind of put it all together in terms of how they work together as a unit. So in supernatus, uh, infraspinatus, sorry, uh, we always look at origin insertion first. So going over to our info section here, origin infraspinosis fossa of the scapula. So this whole flat section here is the infraspinosis fossa of the scapula. So your infraspinatus muscle, infra meaning belief, um, spinous, spinatus, the spinous scapula, okay, it sits pretty much on, on all this flat part of the shoulder blade here on the back. Now you're going to have the rhombo, uh, the lats, the trapezius, excuse me, uh, the trapezius are uh, covering these muscles here, so you won't actually see them, and also lobotomy of the delts, so they're a bit deeper, uh, but you can definitely kind of palpate the muscle uh, with practice, which is super cool. All right, so the whole area is attached onto the shoulder blade, and then it comes out onto the humerus. Okay, so this is the arm bone, the humerus. And on the top of the ridge here, and then on our feature here, if we go back to that, insertion greater tubercle of the humerus. So the greater tub tub tubercle is this region through here. Okay, so remember like tubercles are where often muscles attach to by the tendon. So you, you often have a rough kind of surface. So it gives something for the tendon to kind of connect to, to grab to. So it's on this kind of part of the shoulder. Now, this, this section here this is called the uh, bicepital groove. This is where the bicep tendon um, travels through. And then also the pec major lats um, all have attachments in this area through here as well. But infraspinatus is more posterior, it's more on the back of the actual humerus. And that kind of it will explain its, its action. Action is to laterally rotate and transversely abduct and stabilize the arm at the glenohumeral joint. So when we go into motion, we'll, we'll show you what that looks like. But essentially, it's often called either an external rotator or a lateral rotator. Okay, it's basically the same thing. So depending on which textbooks you talk about, um, you'll either see it regarded to as internal rotation, uh, external rotation, or a lateral rotator. Okay, so there's a little bit of confusion there sometimes with the terminology. Uh, innovation is the C5, C6 nerve. So it's coming out of the base of the neck um, through here. So here we're going to be looking at uh, that's the first thoracic vertebrae. And you know it's the first thoracic vertebrae because it's got a rib attaching to it. Okay, so that's C7 and that's C6, C6 here and C5. So this level of the neck is the most, the nerve comes out of this level of the neck and innovates or supplies the information um, feed to that muscle to contract and relax. So let's have a look at motion. This is really, really the meat of it. So we've got 
the big deltoid muscle here, which we did in the previous video. So just check out the deltoid video if you want to check out that one. We fade all. That's the one. Yeah. So when this muscle contracts, because the scapula, it's like it's attaching onto the whole scapula, there's not much movement on the actual shoulder blade of the muscle. It's all really orientated around the distal attachment on the humerus. And the best way to visualize this is from the side. So here, that's basically anatomical position, so neutral. So you can turn around here, the palms forward, thumb, that's the thumb, that would be on the outside. Okay, thumb is on the radius side. So that's the neutral position there. And then when this muscle contracts, it pulls it into lateral rotation and external rotation. So there. So you're looking at the angle of the shaft of the, of the humerus, so as it rotates, so it's going to rotate it externally. And then to stretch it, it internally rotates to this position. So you can see now all the muscle fibers are lengthened, so that's internally rotated. So if you need to stretch this muscle, you need to internally rotate the shoulder or the humerus to get that on stretch there. So neutral and then external rotation. Full stretch on, neutral, external rotation. Now we look at the other one, the transverse abduction. Here, we're working with the deltoid to pull the shoulder back in that transverse abduction. So think if you're doing a, like a cable rear delt fly, this is the move that you're doing here where you're pulling the arm behind you. So it's not going to be a super powerful muscle, but it's just helping kind of keeping the head of the humerus into the socket. Because what we need to kind of appreciate is this head of the humerus here is a ball and socket joint, and this needs to roll in the glenoid cavity there. So much movements in that space there. So really one of the big roles of the rotator cuff is to keep the head of the humerus in the right position whilst these big move muscles, the deltoids, are creating the big movement. So this is why the stability or stabilizing component of the rotator cuff becomes so important. Because if these muscles get out of sequence, what can happen is, for example, if the infraspinatus wasn't working very well or was too weak or was inhibited for whatever reason, if it doesn't pull the shoulder blade back, if it doesn't pull this back this way to rotate the humerus in the glenoid cavity, what will happen is this muscle in the deltoid will pull from this position and then that'll kick this kind of more anteriorly forward. So you'll get the, the head of humerus pop forward further, potentially. And what that does is it basically jams up all the spaces in here. So you don't get this kind of nice smooth space. One of the key things we've got to always maintain the space between the acromial clavicle AC joint and between the coron coronoid process here and the humerus in the greater uh, tubercle uh, because we've got different tendons coming through here, supraspinatus coming through here and bicep long head tendon, bicep short head tendon coming through here as well. So with those tendons get compromised, it's usually one of those two. Um, then you get rotator cuff injuries and pathology when it's not fun. So in a healthy functional shoulder, this muscle synergy or coordination will happen pretty much organically. Um, so where things go wrong is if people overdevelop certain muscle groups in certain positions or planes, or if they get an actual injury. Um, so usually it's like a habitual, you're doing something over a period of time, which creates a muscular imbalance. Um, or there's an acute kind of injury. It could be you fell off your bike. It could be you're playing a uh, racket sport and you just, something would pop when you serve the ball, something like that. So it just depends on the mechanism of injury. That's always important to figure out. So we want to keep these muscles as functional as possible. And I'll just put in here the pec major. Yeah. 
So we're using Complete Anatomy, which is our app that we use. Uh, back in the day, we'd be in the anatomy lab and we'd have models and actually kind of like cast the bones and resin bones and just like get hands on, which was really great learning because you got more of a 360 tactile kind of component to it. So if you don't have access to an anatomy lab, this is, in my opinion, the next best thing because this, this program is really cool. So we want to put in pec major on the left. So this is the big problem with muscular imbalance, which I know some people say isn't a thing, but I disagree. What we have is small muscle, yeah, infraspinatus versus huge muscle here, pectoralis major. Okay. Now pec major is an internal rotator, so it's going to turn the shaft of the humerus internally. And this little muscle has to compensate and do the opposite, it has to turn external. Okay. So if this muscle is overdeveloped in a short and tight position, essentially what happens is it pulls the humerus into meter rotation, internal rotation, puts that muscle on stretch. When a muscle's on stretch, the fibers are in a lengthened position, so they can't cross bridge. So they can still work, but they just aren't able to generate enough force. And the amount of kind of potential force that these muscle fibers can generate versus the potential force of these muscles, um, this one's going to win on every time. So training technique and posture becomes super important. You, you need to be able to kind of like get your shoulder blade in a good position to allow this muscle to work with this other team of infraspinatus, subscapularis, supraspinatus to kind of keep the head of the humerus in the right spot. And that's not the only one. So we've also got the big lap, lap muscle here, which comes up and it does a similar thing. It kind of creates an, an internal rotation torque as well. So you've got two huge muscles and we've got these small muscles here that are working. So what we need to do is then add in our trapezius muscle. Trapezius on the left. And so when we add in the trapezius muscle, which are those scapular adductors, they keep pulling the arm, shoulder blade back. And then also the rhomboids, which are a bit lower down here. Then we have these big back muscles, which can then actually counterbalance these big anterior muscles. And that's the whole point of muscular imbalance. So you've got to train front and back equally. If you just concentrate on one side or one muscle group, over time you can develop these imbalances. Um, and where the, the joints, because all the joints have a concave and convex surface, so they slide and glide across each other. So if that's not happening, uh, then you can get uneven kind of sliding and gliding on surfaces, and that's a potential mechanism of arthritis um, over a long period of time. Or just loading up different tissue structures unevenly so then you've got more a ligament taking more load than another ligament and so that ligament over time will get frayed and potentially wear down and develop a tear or get inflamed or a tendon that kind of thing so when we're training we, we want to consider agonist antagonist relationships which is opposites so if this pec muscle here is contracting and it's pulling the arm forward then there's a neurological circuit that goes basically to the middle trap, to the infraspinatus, to the rhomboids to say, hey, you guys need to relax to allow your muscles to lengthen so the joint and the bone can move properly. We can use that, that um, agonist-antagonist relationship or what's called reciprocal inhibition to our advantage. So if we are trying to restore balance, what we can do is we can, we can on purpose recruit these muscles here, which will then neurologically re relax these ones by that reciprocal inhibition and then slowly build up a strength here. We can contract a muscle because when a muscle contracts, it is a relaxation response afterwards. So you contract that muscle, then you contract the antagonist muscle, and then you try to get the muscle to move into its full range of movement. So into external rotation. So you release the tension of the tight one first, then you facilitate the weak one or the one that's not in a good position to slowly reposition over time. 
And a lot of that stuff is neurological initially. It's the signaling going up into the into the brain. And it's also kind of like this tensile strength of tissue adaptation. So if tissue gets super tight, uh, like connective tissue, fascia, um, it can get stuck. And then we need soft tissue modalities like massage to kind of like free the stuck tissue, like it ease. There's a um, there's like a, a natural oil in connective tissue called pyrolytic like acid, which gets released with movement. So if it, if it hasn't moved for a long time, that kind of sliding lighting of the fibers is not as effective or efficient, and so the movement can decrease. So there are roles for massage therapy, hundred percent. There are roles for chiropractic, hundred percent, to just kind of get the joints mobilized and moving and get the neural supply from the spinal cord coming to the tissues and to the muscles there's and there's definitely a movement kind of component to it as well as in retraining getting things working correctly and ideally like if, if you've got a good therapy kind of uh, team they're all working together and you might need to see one for a while and another one for a long time um, but typically what should happen is that most of your therapy should be you doing your own exercises to maintain and build up your body in a resilient way and only getting massage or treatment when a you can be training really hard because when you do train hard the body does stiffen up just as a reaction to healing so then you do you may need some work from massage therapy there and or if you have an accident or you can feel your body is um getting out of alignment or something's getting jammed up or impinged just through process of training which happens then getting into you know treatment physio, chiro, osteo, just to get on top of that progressive problem. So getting into it really early is super important. Okay. So that is my little spiel on infrastructure. We'll talk, definitely talk about the other rotator cuff muscles in the next couple of videos coming up. Hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, please drop a, a question in the comment section below. And while you're there, please feel free to give it a like and give it a share. And um, we'll see you in the next video where we talk about, we'll probably do super spinatus or maybe in for a, I never really have a plan. I just kind of like load this thing up and just kind of talk off the cuff. So, <laughs> so it'll be one of those. All right. So until then, I will see you then.